All right, well, let's go ahead then and get, get started. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us here tonight. Uh, Metropolitan is always psyched and very excited to help the international community integrate and to get value from really cool, cool experts in their subject matter. Here tonight, we have speaker uh, Raf Jacobs, who's an expert in helping people, uh, I guess, discern the best prices, the best strategies, uh, the best apartments and boutique properties, both commercial and residential. And today we're going to be talking about the subject of the buying process. It's something that's near and dear to our hearts for anybody who moves here. It's a big acquisition and we're really happy to have you here. Raf, um, anything else you want to share besides the rest of the series? No, maybe you want to talk about this, Victor? Okay, well, you know, we're going to have, the, the series is comprised of four different episodes and we're going to be talking about the full life cycle of everything that you need to know about how to buy uh, a property to get the best price. And uh, we have, the first part was uh, on, in September where we did the must know tips. We're gonna be talking about the buying process this evening. Uh, in about a month from now, November the 4th, we're gonna be talking about mortgages. And then again in December, we're gonna talk about dilemmas. What can go wrong? So at each stage, we encourage people to write a lot of questions. We encourage you guys to not to have to wait until the series is over. Definitely get in touch with Inspire uh, boutique property experts as soon as possible, especially if you're in the middle of considering buying an apartment now, you want to make sure that you avail yourself of the expertise that Rob, Rob has uh, generated over the years. And uh, I don't know if there's anything else that you would like to emphasize right now, but um, Raph, I think you're going to do an excellent series. Um, if anything, like last time, we had a lot of very active questions and uh, it might actually be interesting to talk about some of the things that uh, impressions that you found after the, uh, the first yeah. episode. Yeah, we, we, will, we will do for sure. Can share some insights from the last and feedback we got from the last, from the previous webinar. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, the purpose of today is to share tips, tricks, insights, analysis that we believe from Inspire are, are, are important for you to know when you're about to make a real estate decision in Spain. So some of you might be thinking of buying a property, maybe other people are thinking of uh, switching from renting to becoming an owner. Um, some other ones might be investing in a property, other people look for a second residence, maybe other ones are, want to sell their, their property in Spain. So um, um, the, the, the biggest thing that can go wrong is if you buy a property and afterwards you regret it. If, if there's problems with the property or if uh, what happens a lot as well is that people overpay for, for properties in Spain just because uh, they, they might not have the reference point that they need for, um, for, for, for proper evaluation of the property. Um, you will find very good deals in Spain in the near future. Uh, since the start of COVID, the market has changed to a buyer's market. Uh, prices have dropped significantly. You can buy today with a lot larger discounts than uh, seven, eight months ago. Uh, but caution is required. Uh, not everything that shines is gold. And there's also a lot of um, potential issues on, on the market with properties with very low, very, very low prices. Um, my job, but in, I'm, I'm not going to talk here about what we do at Inspire, but you need to, in, in a nutshell, I, I'm going to explain you a little bit because um, that helps you understand where the examples come from, where what I mentioned is, is, is based on. Um, my job is to help people like you uh, make better decisions, meaning getting the best property at the best prices, avoid risks, anticipate potential challenges um, in, in, in a buyer-seller relationship or when you only want to buy a property or contractually or technically, uh, give you that peace of mind so that you know that you don't pay too much, that is, the whole process is de-risked um, and you know it's a good decision, good value for money, mm -hmm. that you don't make typical, typical mistakes. Um, Again, this call is not to talk about our services, but I, I do want you to know that if you have questions, if you if you are searching for properties, if you think you might benefit from help, reach out to us. It, that is what we do at Inspire. We do these webinars because we don't believe in advertising. We believe in providing relevant uh, information, con content to people. Um, and that's, that is for us the, the, the best way to, to, to make people come to us with their questions. Um, so that's, uh, you, you have our, uh, my email address there. You have our, our blog there for more, for more insights. So don't hesitate if there is any questions. Um, 
Victor mentioned briefly why we do these webinars to keep you informed. Um, one part of the insights come from, I, I, I analyze the market, I monitor the market, I teach about the property market at the University of Barcelona, um, but I also speak quite a lot in, in the media and more and more actually, because the market is changing and people want to know um, experts' opinions. So there, there is, on our blog, you find most of the articles, interviews, opinions uh, about the property market uh, from the last five, five, six months. Um, and there's quite some from the, from the leading leading media, newspapers and so on in, in, in Spain. Uh, there was one, one published yesterday by Imo Academy where we talk about uh, what happening, what's happening with the prices. Why do we see overpriced properties on the market? Um, there's one uh, published in La Vanguard, in, in Idealista, I think as well, yesterday or earlier this week, um, with insights on, on prices and, and how agencies work and, and don't work in Spain. So uh, very important to mention as well, there is um, here 19th of October, the Barcelona Expat Week is starting. Um, for those of you who might not know this, it was an expat day in the past. It's the City Council of Barcelona organizes info sessions for the expat community living here or planning to live here or to move here about plenty of different topics. On Monday the 19th, um, I've been asked by the City Council to speak about property, renting, buying uh, for the expat audience in Spain. So you can join that as well. I will share the link as well at the end of the webinar if you want to do that. It's, it's an online session as well. So. And then, and then before we jump into the content, who do we work with? What do we do at Inspire? It's people who are at, at different stages in their property life cycle, buying, selling, buying as an investment to live, a second residence, also helping people renovate their properties more and more because there is good deals on the market today. If you buy a property in Spain, um, it needs some upgrade, it needs some improvements to make it actually, to adapt it to what you want and to make it a lot better, to add value to it. Um, it's for people, um, I think like yourself, we, we see, if I, if I look back approximately on the transactions this year, we see property prices, so properties that people buy with our support, ranging from 150,000 up to a million and a half. That's a wide gap, a wide range, but at the same time, about, uh, about 80% of these uh, purchases are properties in between two and 500,000 euros. Um, and we see a trend as well to more and more younger buyers as well. It's interesting. Um, we thought it would happen when Corona started because young people are often the first one also to buy in the stock market uh, stock and to invest in, in property. Uh, but we see more, more than we expected of, of young people. Young, I mean, uh, we work with customers out of 28 years old. Uh, they even have tax benefits when they buy here and they live here. So that it's, it's also very attractive for them. So what are we gonna talk about today? Um, uh, we've done the, the welcome part. We talk about a few things, five must know things about the property market that you need to know before you embark on a searching or buying process or even on a selling process. Uh, that's going to be very brief. Um, speak about typical concerns buyers have. We've, we've done some research. Um, people have, have told us what their concerns are. I'm going to share this briefly with you. And then we dive into the buying process. 10 steps. We go step by step. Uh, what is the order? What is important? What to watch out for? Examples of things you should uh, avoid uh, when buying in Spain. And, and then of course, at the end, there's time for your questions. Uh, this is a webinar for you. So enter your questions in the chat function and um, we respond to them all at the, end of the, at the end of the webinar. We should be finished by, by 9 p.m. That's the, that's the target. But if there's more questions, if there's interest, I can keep going, no problem if, if there's more more interest. So you know now who we are and what we're going to do today. So we're going to launch a brief poll on your screen. You can see a pop-up message now. Just tell us briefly who you are. Are you thinking of buying a property or selling a property, investing in a property? This helps me pick the examples I use in, in the rest of this, of this webinar. So you should now see a pop-up. I see half of the people has voted or has answered the question. Three out of four have answered. Have a look, please, if you still see the... Yeah. A few more. Uh, three more seconds. One, 
two, three. Yeah, we had quite some participants here. So I will, I will just explain the results. So you see, it's still open if you want to vote. Um, everybody on the call is interested in buying. Um, in buying a property, nobody's interested in selling a property, and um, about 13% is interested in buying as an investment. Mm -hmm. So that's good. That's very helpful. Th thanks for sharing this. That's very helpful for me. Okay. In the previous webinar, and Victor mentioned this briefly, we asked we asked um, people a question, a poll: When you buy a property in Spain. And the typical way to buy a property is you search on websites like Idealista, then you, you get in contact with an agency who show you properties. So when you buy a property to an agency, who is the customer of that agency? That was a question. And then we saw people could choose the buyer is the client, the seller is the customer of the agency, or both buyer and seller are the customer because they, they intermediate and therefore both are customer. Um, we got a dramatic error rate in the responses. Uh, the only right answer is that the seller, the landlord, is the client of the real estate agency in Spain. It's different from some other countries, um, but it means that from from the there are more people on the last webinar than this webinar. Um, half of the people would start off their journey basically putting their trust, believing they are the customer, and therefore putting their trust in the in the person in the company who only cares about your counterpart, who only cares about the seller and the seller's interests. Hmm? We, which are quite different from, which is basically selling at the highest possible price and quickly. Um, so th that's how the beer is in mind. An agency works for the seller. Uh, what what we do is we accompany the buyer. So we are on the side of the buyer, the investor at, at Inspire. That's why the examples also be very lot more relevant. Okay, so five things about, about the property market before we talk about the process. Um, for, some of you might have bought properties already, might be searching at the moment, uh, might be in contact with agencies. But um, it's very important to understand that the market is not regulated in Spain. There's no, uh, there's no rules of the game. Um, it's an unregulated uh, playing field. There's no fence around it. Uh, anyone can enter the market. Anyone can sell properties in a lot of parts of Spain without any qualification, without any training, without needing a license, um, even without having to res register yourself or your company as a, re as a realtor. You don't have to. In some parts you have to, but it doesn't mean much. Um, that's one thing. That's why you see so many agencies. Look at this. This is a map of a part of Barcelona. Every red dot is a real, real estate agency, an agency that sells properties and works for the seller. The part you see here on the bottom left corner is kind of Plaza España. Here we have Plaza Tetuan. This is the Gran Via. There is a diagonal. So it's it's the part of a champla uh, that you see here. And this black square here is one manzana. So we call it one block in, in a champla. It's, it's about 100 by 100 meters approximately. So in some parts, there might even be more agencies and properties for sale in some in some areas of Barcelona or in Spain. That's because there's no entry barriers. Anyone can can join. At the same time, people who sell are not liable for anything they tell you. If if they're not obliged to give you all information about the property, if something is not okay, if there is cons if there is technical problems, if there is financial debt on it, if there's problems with the ownership, if there is, if it's affected by urban plans that might affect your property or the future value of your property, they don't have to mention it. If you don't ask it, they won't mention it probably. Um, and if they don't mention it, or even if they give wrong information, we had a case recently where the agency said the, the building passed the technical building inspection, which is mandatory for certain buildings. Then a bit later, we figured out it didn't pass a technical building inspection. We figured out before committing, before our clients committing to, to buy that property. But if, if you figure out too late and you say, yeah, but you told me it passed the inspection and therefore the property is in, in okay conditions, it's, you, you can't do anything. It's no, no liability, liability involved, it's a joke. Thirdly, the, in many countries, when you buy a property, one of the first things you do is you contact your notary and your notary runs a due diligence process on that property. Your notary talks to the notary of the selling party and both notaries make sure that it's a perfect deal, there's no risk involved and everything is transparent. 
in Spain there's only one notary involved, the buyer chooses a notary, and you only see the notary the one last hour of a three, four, five, six month journey of searching and buying a property. So it's not involved earlier on, it's not responsible for checking anything on your property, that's your job as, as a buyer. At the same time, the market is not transparent, there's no single place where you can find information about properties, hist historic data about the property, prices, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, or things about charges or debt and so on. So that's that makes it difficult because the good properties sell quickly. There is demand on the Spanish market. So you need to take a quick decision or, or you lose a property, but you don't have transparent information. You lack documents, you lack information. Um, and that's not very helpful, that's a risk. At the same time, keeping in mind that the seller doesn't have to tell you everything about it, doesn't have to be transparent mm -hmm. and nobody checking it for you. So you, you've got to know this. At the same time, there is, um, Today, because of Corona, Corona means economic recession, slowdown, more unemployment, uh, bar gains on the market. It will result in, in lower property prices. Um, but at the same time, be very careful because a lot of bad properties, problematic properties, that as bar gains. In Spanish, it call it choyos. Uh, and again, without liability. So it's not just the price. That, that's, not, that's not the only decision factor and uh, don't get misled by, by that factor. Um, so what are buyers worried about when they, when they embark, embark on a journey? That's a research we did with, um, with 100 candidate buyers. And the number one, so about 80% of the respondents said they were worried when they buy in Spain, they would pay too much. These were all international buyers, people like yourself, either living in Spain already or not yet paying too much. Second is making mistakes. Making mistakes in these non-regulated market. People realize that when you work with agencies, it, it can be quite complex to feel, to get trust, to get information, to get a knowledgeable person in front of you, to get your questions answered. So you're worried to make mistakes. Um, and the third main concern is problems with the property itself. So that, that's rather technical problems, problems with the community of owners, um, uh, financial surprises linked to the property, etc. And the fourth one, not surprisingly, I think, is people indicators that sometimes I just feel there's too many agencies. They see one property listed with several agencies, sometimes at different prices, and they give you different information when you call them. They, they, there's no coherent messaging. Um, and the final part is the financials. That's basically how do I pay for the property? As an, as an expat, uh, do I take a mortgage? Do I pay cash if I have savings? Do I take a mortgage in Spain or in my home country? That will be addressed in the next webinar. Um, but these, these concerns, if you, you might reckon, recognize yourself in this, in this chart, uh, this is all from the last uh, three months, this data. Um, but it's, it's very normal you feel, you might feel overwhelmed, overwhelmed or, um, or uncertain about things. So hopefully we can take away some of these concerns now. So when you start a buying process uh, or searching process, the first thing to do is, um, is preparing for it. It's, the first thing to do is not going to the Alista, is not going to search for properties, visiting properties. You will waste a lot of time and you might get frustrated fairly quickly. So um, you've got to be realistic. And we, we, we do this with every client at the very beginning. We need to find a realistic balance between three, three key factors the property characteristics, what do you want, how big, how beautiful, how modern the property needs to be, how many bedrooms, etc. what about the view, the locations, which areas do you like to have your property. So if it's Barcelona, we talk area, areas mean what part of Echampla or what part of, um, of Poble Sec or Poble Nau or uh, Saria. So you've got to be specific uh, and price. What's your budget? Own funds plus um, a potential mortgage. A lot of people embark on a journey with wrong expectations, expectations that can't, you can't find certain properties. So, and the only way, it's like an equalizer, is if you want to go, if you want to go up on property features, it means you either bring your price up as well, or you go lower on location. That's a how I try to visualize this, this concept. Now, some people struggle to understand this and they keep searching and searching. And we spoke to, to a, a local person, Javier, and he said, I've, I've seen 60 properties uh, together with his girlfriend. And I think they were about to, about to split up because they did, and they didn't find what they, what they wanted. 
And we had this first workshop and it was really about expectations were, were not realistic. So we, we could adjust it, work with the bank to get a better, more, higher mortgage, at the same time challenge them on certain locations um, to, to keep into account. And, and, and that worked very well. And then uh, he bought a property uh, last week. So that, that's important, keep that in mind. Then let's talk about um, the buying process itself. There's 10 steps. I'm going to talk about the different steps with, 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 with examples and what, what it means when a step is successful. Um, the pr preparation part, we talked about the, the, the target definition of, and that means property location price, we, we discussed that, but also your financials. Um, working with a bank and be realistic on, on that. Some people come to us and say, in Spain, the bank finances 80% of the purchase price. Now, that depends. And that depends a lot, actually, because if you're, it depends if you're which country you are from, it depends which bank you talk to, it depends if, depends if you're a resident or a non-resident in Spain. Uh, so meaning you actually live here or, or don't live here. Um, if you pay taxes here, yes or no. It depends on your income, depends on the, the amount of own funds you can put into the deal. Um, so it's not necessarily 80%. Also on, on that part, run early simulations with your bank. Ask your own bank, first of all, uh, how much they can finance. Um, tell them how many savings you're prepared to put into the transaction and see what that gives the total number is. Prepare for additional costs like the purchase tax, which is 10% in, in Catalonia. Um, prepare for some other costs like notary and, and land registry, which is less than 2,000 euros on average. Um, so there's not too many other costs, but build that picture correctly. Otherwise, again, you get surprises further down the road and you might not be able to, uh, to, to, to find the property you're actually, actually looking for. Um, if you do that proper, properly, it also means that, and that's what often goes wrong, if you find a great property that you really like and you can pay for it, but if you're not prepared, you might lose it just because you're not, just because you're not ready. You can't act on it quickly enough and someone else does. Mm -hmm. That's why this preparation is, is is very important. And today in the market, the, there is discount. We, we see prices drop in Barcelona between five, ten percent, sometimes a bit more for properties that have some some, some disadvantages. Across Spain, they can easily drop by by ten, twelve percent on average. And even for second residences on the coast, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised that we see price drops there between 15, 20, maybe even 25% in some areas of, of, of the costas. Uh, so that's big discounts. But again, it, it, buyers see that as a discount. Buyers know that it's a unique opportunity. Uh, so be, be prepared, otherwise you might, might miss it. The other thing to do upfront is to know how you will be searching um, and how much time you want to dedicate to that. Um, uh, you, you, you put your filters on a different websites, uh, et cetera, of course, but you also need to know when I hit a wall, when I have questions and doubts, who do I contact? Because you need quick decisions. You need to be able to respond, uh, to take eval to do evaluations fairly in, in, in a short, uh, short cycle time. Um, you can search alone. You can do it with support from people like us or, or, or other professionals in the sector, but you've got to know how you want to go about it and then you start your search. That's the second, um, second, uh, second step. Searching online, visiting properties, making appointments, um, and then shortlisting them. That searching and visiting is very time-consuming. Shortlisting is more that you need good, good criteria to know which properties are actually. It's not just do I like the property. If it were just that simple, then um, I think uh, we won't have to run this webinar probably. Actually, um, there's a study and it says that a, a bit more than one out of three people uh, wouldn't buy the property where they live today. They wouldn't buy that again if they could do it over because they figured out afterwards that some things was not okay or the experience was, was bad with a certain agent or they didn't feel trust or they, would ju or they just think they could have found something better for, for the amount of money they have. That's a very sad number. One out of three isn't totally happy with the place they bought. They think they could have done better. So you need time for this. Be, be very focused um, in, with, with realistic expectations, but also keep in mind how these agencies work, that they work for the seller and you need to do your own homework. You need to get your 
don't just believe what a seller is, is telling you. It might be right, it might be wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and what works very well is you, you've, in our experience, when, when you see a property, write down right after the visit what you like about it, what you don't like about it. Because if, if you wait till the next till evening till the next day and you've seen three, four, five properties, you don't remember the details and it makes the decision making more difficult. You can't we can't be that objective anymore to, to compare one property against against another property. So um, being organized, document it it's it's simple tips and tricks here, but it, it's very, very important. Um, we use checklists for for helping people evaluate uh, properties so that you don't look only at, is this is it big enough? Is the view okay? Is the building in good conditions? But that you think about, about the long term, about the value for money of a property. Can I easily rent it if I want to rent it out in the future? Or if, I, if my life changes and I want to sell it again? Is there demand on this market? How is that street at night? Um, how, how are the financials of the, commu the financial of the community? Is, is, there, is there debt or is everybody nicely paying? Um, things that um, you've got to watch out for. Understanding who your neighbors are. It's very different to buy a property in a building um, with all people who live there than when your neighbor is, for instance, having a tourist apartment and renting it out over Airbnb. And every second or third day, you've got people arriving with luggage at 11 in the evening and leaving at five in the morning to get the, the cheap flight back to their home country. So these things are, we, we use checklists for that to, uh, to, to help you take better informed, informed decisions there. When you like properties, um, and here I think it starts to become complex and in Spain, you've got to identify potential red flags before moving ahead. The people that have, that have visited properties will have seen probably that the agencies can be very pushy um, commercially to say, come to the office, make an offer. Um, tomorrow, someone else is coming for the second time. They come with their parents, they really love it. So if you like it, come and make an offer, even if it's below the asking price. Of course, that's their business. They want to get offers. They get a commission once a seller accepts an offer. So that's what you should not do. Uh, walk to the agency and, and, and put a signature on, on a piece of paper making an offer. That's, that's too early. Got to figure out these things like the building inspector. We, we had cases where the we knew the property didn't pass the mandatory technical building inspection happens a lot with older properties the beautiful old properties in in barcelona we knew it didn't pass it but it there was not a problem because the community had already agreed on the works that had to be done to improve the property structurally uh, and from a safety point of view there was a budget for it already and it was clear that the owner would pay the the costs until the date of the of the sale, and then the buyer is responsible for it. So that that's okay. It's not meeting all the requirements from a building inspection because the repairs have not been done. But there is a plan, and you know what the costs are going to be. There's other cases where um, the building has didn't pass the test of the building inspection, and there's no. We had a case recently. There's no budget yet, and between the client. Uh, committing in an ARAS contract, which is commitment contract, commit contract to commit to buy a property and you pay 10%. Between that moment and going to the notary, the community of neighbors, of owners, had had a meeting where they agreed on what works to do on the building and they committed to costs, to budgets of, uh, of building, of building companies. So that's a problem. Because you've committed to buy the property at a certain price and in the meanwhile, someone else takes a decision, who's the owner today, uh, about future costs that might affect you. So these things have to be identified and managed properly um, before you agree on price, before you agree on other, on other purchase conditions. Because there's a very thin line between a great purchase and a purchase that um, might keep your, keep your, your sleep away. Um, the same happens here with, for instance, um, the urban planning in, in Barcelona, or outside Barcelona. Uh, there were cases recently where a couple from Belgium, they, they wanted to buy a house. They really loved a certain house on the Costa Brava. It was a little road just behind the garden. T tiny road, not, not, not important. And Bart said, the most important thing for me is to have, uh, it, needs to, it needs to be quiet. I don't want to have noise. I'm a busy job. I want to disconnect here. So there were plans to widen, to widen that road. There was no date fixed to it, um, but to connect two villages, to make it a larger connection road. So that, that's a red flag. 
right? Because that's not in line with your priorities as a buyer. And if you don't spot this, again, the seller didn't mention it, you might commit to buy and then you might not be happy in your place and end up in this list of people who wouldn't buy their, their property again. And that's what we don't want, of course. Um, other examples, um, a, a house recently on, on the cost, Costa Blanca, but more inland. Um, the, the owner said there is a deposit of water for, there was a big piece of land next to the house, for watering the garden, the irrigation, etc. So it's very convenient because it's like, there was like 30,000 liters of water deposit. Uh, oh, fantastic. What he didn't say is that that water, that water didn't come from a, from a well. That water, he had to order it to buy it. They would deliver it by lorries every month and it's very expensive to deliver every month water for his garden. But it was the only way because the house was detached from the village and there was no own water supply. That's, so that's things that you might buy it and afterwards have major surprises that, um, that, doesn't, that don't make you happy. If your property passes these tests, your shortlisting and, and there's no red flag, so you can eliminate the red flags, you can manage them, then it's time to think about the price. It's still, you're still not going again, you're still not going to the agency and signing a reserva, a reservation contract, an option. No, not yet. Think about the price. How do you determine what is the right price for this property? It's very easy to overpay for properties. It's very easy for expats to overpay because most of expat reference points are in their home countries. And they see a property in where they say, oh, a property is asking price is 340,000. It's fantastic, fantastic. Uh, it's, 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 it's very cheap, for us. So, so beautiful property. Um, but that's the wrong reference point. You've got to compare to the local market. You've got to compare in the situation today with Corona, with the economic recession, with what we think will happen in the market today. How much is this property uh, actually worth? And um, again, there's a thin line, but a big difference. Um, how do you judge if 360 as an asking price is great, is maybe expensive, or you should rather pay 340? But between 340 and 360 is 20,000 euro difference, and that's a lot. That's a lot of money that you can save just by doing proper preparation, benchmarking, and, and knowing what is the right value for this property, which you use then in the negotiation. This is also, um, impacted this negotiation, should, you should impact it by having someone technically check the property before you buy it. Because an architect will always see things that you might not see, and that's things that you can use in negotiations to bring the price down or to get other, other conditions agreed. Um, but it, so it, again, it's not just about, I like the property. If you, here's a tip, if you go, if you're a couple and you go and see a property and you really like it and you both like it, and you think that's one you're gonna buy, that's okay. But one person should be the good cop, the other person, the bad cop, it's absolutely necessary. If you both smile and you both, and, and, and you hug each other and you say, wow, how lovely, your negotiation potential is gone. You, you won't negotiate this, the, the, the agency sees they're trained for this, that you're willing to pay for this property, that you're willing to pay for an emotional factor and, and you need to avoid that. When we negotiate for our customers, which is our daily job, we take the emotion out. Um, uh, we just look at the hard facts, how much is this worth? And we go in as, as killer negotiators with the, with the sellers. If you do it properly, you'll pay less, a lot less and you will have more money left for things like innovation or fixing the terrace or maybe buy furniture, etc., or just saving it. Um, on this topic, and there was more in the, in the previous webinar, we, we, we talked about that, you can still listen to it, but the, the prices are dropping in Spain and we've seen six months ago, seven months ago, it was very hard when you buy a property to, and you take a mortgage, the bank makes a, a evaluation, an appraisal. Um, typically, the, you had a purchase price, and then it often a appraisal from the bank close to or often below the purchase price. That was quite common uh, six six months a year a year ago. Today, in the transactions we did in the last two months, in no single case, the purchase price was above the value the bank estimated. In every single case, of the last 10, 10 transactions. Um, 
the bank valued the property for more, and more means between 30 and 50,000 more, even one case in was 85 or 95,000 euro above the purchase price. And that's because, what I mentioned before, there's deals on the market. Be, be, be aware of it. Um, if this happens to you, by the way, um, you might want to speak with your lawyer um, because the tax administration might consider, might be, might become suspicious and might think that you are paying uh, not all the purchase price officially. So you've got to prepare the proper documents to avoid that you get um, an additional tax declaration afterwards for because they think you buy, you buy below the, the market value of the property. When all these things are done, one, two, three, and four, then you reserve a property. Go to the agency, you look at the document properly, and then you can start, you can uh, sign something. But again here, uh, with the reservation you pay in Spain 1% of the purchase price maximum, sometimes a bit less. Exception is new new developments of planned properties. There you pay easily five, 6,000 euros of a fixed a fix amount. Normally up to 1%. We try to negotiate this 1% down just to limit the risk as well. Um, it's a short contract, a reservation contract, um, but it's important. Um, be, be, you, you can lose your money. If the, if, the, if the seller agrees to the conditions you put on the reservation uh, and you don't buy afterwards, you lose that amount of money. So two, three, four, five thousand euros, depending on the purchase price, you might lose. But also, there's unfortunately a lot of agencies who provide reserva contracts to the happy buyers, people are in a good mood, they, they, they found their property. Now it, we just need to transfer 3,000 euros and, and sign the reservation and we, we, it's ours. There's of, often clauses in these contracts that are terrible for you as buyers. Clauses that, um, that, that where you accept already, it's, it's unbelievable, where you, where you accept conditions of contracts that you have even not seen in the future. Um, that, that, that's the kind of thing that happen in non-regulated non markets. And you can never, never sign anything that you, that you don't have seen. And I know this sounds like everyone thinks like, you know, of course we don't do this, people do it. We see these, these cases way too often where people sign the wrong, the wrong documents. Uh, it's also important here to see, to look, uh, who do you pay to? When you make your reservation, do you pay to the agency or do you pay to the owner? Both is legally okay, but depending on the case, you got to evaluate what is better. In Spain, um, I think that in the next few months, um, three to six months, one in five agencies will disappear. They will run out of business because there will be less transactions in the next in the next um, months, or next year. Um, and many agencies are not professionalized enough to run through a recession. They, they might not know how to handle it. They might not have the liquidity or the cash to keep to keep going. Um, so be mindful if you make a payment, if that to an agency, if that agency tomorrow doesn't pick up the phone anymore and the shutter is down, then you you will forget. You you will you will have to forget the the money that you pay to them. So again, in the contract, prepare for it. Be uh, uh, be, be careful. Don't do things that you wouldn't do in your in your home country. Never pay things in cash. Uh, it's not a good idea because um, the chances are way too high that you that you lose some of this some of this money. A reservation contract might be emotionally a very important step for you. Legally speaking, it's a very low level of protection. It means officially the agent shall take the property off the market. In reality, they often don't do it. They keep commercializing the property behind your back just to to try and find someone who pays more for the property. Imagine you buy a 300,000 euro property, you pay 3,000 euro with a reservation. If they find someone who pays instead of 300,000, 310,000 euros, mm -hmm, what they will do is sign another reservation with the other, with a new buyer. It's illegal, but they do it. Uh, with new buyer, they will set, they will tell you, oh, there was a problem, there's a concern, there's another buyer. Uh, Here's your money back. Here's your 3,000 euro back. It's not fair. Uh, it's, it's zero ethics, but it's what happen in, happens in the market because they sell at a higher price and they get a higher commission from their seller. That's how the how the, the sector works. You can't generalize, of course. There, there is good agencies, but it's very, very common that they keep looking for, for, for people who buy more. And then what can you do legally? Legally, your the law is on your side. Nobody takes a lawyer 
to try and recover something, uh, to try and recover 3,000 euros or to try and recover property, if, if it, it's, it's very difficult. So that's why it's important to make sure you, when you do the visiting, the shortlisting, that you start getting all the information that you need and things that, try and anticipate what, what might happen in the future with a property or with a buyer. Get that ready and go as quick as possible to the next contract, which is an ARAS contract, in an earnest money, earnest money agreement where you pay 10% of the purchase price you commit to buy and you're really sure about the transaction. Uh, but before you do that, you've got to run through additional steps, additional um, validations. And here they are. I'm switching my screen, changing my screen now. So step seven is the ARAS contract. Step six before we get there is proper due diligence. Um, again, something that a lot of people forget and we see very smart people falling in love with a property and just accepting a contract, an ARAS contract presented by the agency which is not defending their interests and say, okay, we just signed this. This is a standard ARAS contract. You find it on the internet. It's not what you should do. It's not protecting your interests as as the buyer, because again, you don't have, they don't have to inform you um, uh, about all the, about any defects. Um, if a seller tells you, if a salesperson tells you, uh, this is all okay, we know, the, we know the owner for many years, there's a lot of trust, confiance involved in our relationship, don't believe it. You don't know that, it might not be true. From my experience, I dare to say it's probably not true because the agencies don't build up long-term relationships. They go for one-off transactions. That's, that's how the business model works and try and get a lot of volume because many agencies disappear after a few years, others open. So this due diligence has different elements. There's a very important legal part. That's what a lawyer needs to do. You, know, you need a lawyer in Spain to buy a property. There's a technical part. I mentioned before, an architect sees things that you and I might not see. Um, and there's a financial part. Make sure there's no surprises on, on future costs that might pop up and that you could actually have identified upfront because it entirely changes your, your, your purchase. If you pay 300 and then the, the, an invoice comes after a year or two years for, it was a case where the buy, a buyer asked me to, to help me try and get out of an RS contract because they committed and they figured out there was a 20,000 euro maintenance cost coming up for the building, a small building with only four property, four apartments in it, 80,000 euro maintenance costs for the facade and the rear facade, uh, 70,000 per, per, per neighbor, per owner. He couldn't afford it, didn't see it in advance, so problems. Um, le legally, what, what is important? Let, let's, let's go, let's give a few examples here. Two main reasons why properties are sold in Spain are guess what? Divorces and inheritances. It's the same in, in many countries. But there are two big drivers for, for people to, to, for families to sell, to sell properties. Uh, both have, both can be easy and complex depending on the family, depending on how the relationships are. Um, both have tax implications. People, be, if, 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 you, if there's an inheritance, uh, you've got to accept the inheritance in Spain. You've got to pay inheritance tax on that. And only then you can sell a property free of charges. When you buy a property, it needs to be, it must be free of charges. It's very, very important because otherwise the tax authorities or other persons can come back to you and claim money of you. And it's the last thing you want because it's not your responsibility and you can manage it upfront. So, Examples are um, the, the transaction recently where people buy a property of French owners. It was a property on the Costa Brava. Of, of the owners were French. They sell it. The husband did pass away, and the the wife sells the property and had three kids. So the wife signs the documents to reserve it, and then we figure out the wife is actually not. The, the only owner, the, kid, the, the, the husband isn't there anymore. The property is still registered on both of their name. The kids own half of the property amongst the three of them. They didn't pay inheritance tax, they didn't declare it yet in Spain. So, and then the seller said, but that's not a problem because when you go to the notary and when you pay the full amount of your property, 300,000, um, we asked the notary to cancel those charges, to register the inheritance, to pay the tax, to withhold it, etc. That's not good. Um, this, need, this can't be done in parallel. You need to do this sequentially. Otherwise, you as a buyer are exposed to risks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
So better postponing a purchase, postponing the signature at the notary by three, four weeks, manage that properly with, with the sellers, and then you're, you're sure, then you, do, you, you know that nobody can claim against you for that, for that property. Um, also, due diligence also means that you need to anticipate things. Huh? For instance, now with Corona, we had a, a, a purchase recently where the owner was an old lady, she was in a, in a residence for elderly people and she sells her property. Um, so one is, and, and her daughter is the one, her daughter was 70 and she was the one who, who manages the day-to-day -day transaction or the communication. Is she capable of selling it? That need, is there documentation? Because otherwise you might commit, you might pay 10%. Um, and this was an expensive property. You might pay 10%. And if the daughter afterwards says, I don't agree, how do you get your 40,000 euros back, your 10% back? It's not that easy. Um, but also we, we foresaw for, for, for saw clauses in the ADAS contract in the next step, in, in, in the, the big important document. Um, what happens if that old lady, if she would pass away in between you committing to buy and actually uh, going to a notary? Because there was COVID hmm? and residences are a high risk zone. We, we all knew that. So let, let's face reality. Let's foresee things in the contract. What happens if, okay? Um, what happens if Okupas enter the property you want to buy between the time you pay 10% and you go to notary? Mm -hmm. So all of these things are never in standard contracts, but I recommend you get these, you think about them, you include them, you're going to sleep a lot better. And, and you, you, because, because otherwise you enter in, in discussions in a gray area and um, I, I can promise you that if there is a discussion, the agency who has been smiling at you in the past will certainly become very hard and say, talk to our lawyer. So avoid that just by anticipating it. So the legal part, I think that's clear. The technical part, the architect, um, make sure you got a proper opinion. Um, certainly if the property needs a renovation. And, and three, the financial part, checking that with, with the community, there's no outstanding uh, bills to be paid with the utility companies, with the city administration, the city tax. Um, we, had, we had a case recently, it was an old man who had a shop, the shop went bankrupt, he had some debt. Uh, so the, the, the bank could actually claim uh, some of the debt from the property uh, and these things can be sorted out. It's not difficult to sort it out, but you got to do it before you sign the ARAS contract. And that is step seven. Um, um, with an ARAS contract, you pay 10% to this to the seller or to the agency, but it's money that belongs to the seller. Um, so 10% in, typically including the 1% you paid already. So you pay 1% and actually 9%. So in, in total, it should be 10% of the purchase price that, that you pay at this point. With a proper contract, um, make sure you understand what it is. What is the implication of an ADAS contract? It means uh, if you don't buy the property, you lose your money. You lose 10%. Mm -hmm. Force majeure, of course, exists, but that is, that is not standard. At the same time, your protection comes from the fact that if the seller would not sell your property, what they can do with a reserve, if someone pays 10,000 more, if they don't sell the property to you now, the sellers, they owe you the double of the amount you paid as others. So they owe you 20%. Example, a property is worth 300,000, you have paid 30,000 with others. You don't buy the property, you lose your 30,000. If they would not sell it, they owe you 60,000. And that is a big protection. So if someone else comes along and, and pays 10, 20, 30,000 more, 40,000 more, they, they won't be incentivized the agencies to do that or the sellers to do that because simply they have a big penalty and a legal problem. So that's the, uh, how, how it works uh, from, from a legal point of view, from a commitment point of view, from a guarantees point of view to you. Um, but one part is the law and the law might protect you. The other part is what happens in practice. Um, because in practice, if you don't foresee things in your contract and things don't go the way you expect it, you might be right, but you will have to take a lawyer and you will be busy for one, maybe two years or maybe longer. And th th that's not, that's, th that's the last thing you want, of course, when, when you buy, when you buy a property. Um, so I say, Anticipate things. What does that mean? Um, if you if you between committing to buy a, a property, Aras, and 
having the keys in your hand, if you want to access that property, if you want to go and visit it with maybe a builder to see what renovation works you can do, if you want to show it to your kids, if you want to uh, yeah, just access it, that needs to be agreed upon. Because some people are nice, but some people aren't. And the agency sometimes say, no, sorry, until the notary, we can't show it to you again. Mm -hmm. And because for them, it's they know you're committed, they know you have to buy, and uh, for them, it's time investment and it's not it's zero additional revenue for them because they just need to go and show it again to you. Mm -hmm. And so, you get to foresee these things. Um, think about when you go to notary, typically, or you at least you should get then a title of ownership plus the keys of a property. There's cases where people go to a notary. And you get the, the title of ownership, but you only get the keys of a property because the owner still needs to live there or wants to live there for a few weeks, for a month, for two months, because they've bought another property and they need to do the to change uh, properties or the property is not ready yet, etc. These things are very dangerous if you do that, um, because if the person wouldn't leave your property, it's very hard to get them out of it, even if it's not with bad intentions um, and you have a major problem. These things have to be agreed upon. We had a, a case recently with a um, pretty well-known agency, and only the, I think, an hour before we had the other's contract, the, the draft was had been reviewed several times, and just before signing it, said, "Oh yeah, there's one little thing. Well, what, one little thing we should we should still add here is is is, is not the owner. Uh, so they stay there instead of end of September when you go to notary. They still stay there for two months." Like well, th that's not a little thing. That's a major thing. That's potentially a deal breaker for for such a for for, for such a purchase. So be be mindful because what agencies call a small little thing, which they always do like that, is potentially not not what you shall what you shall do. Okay. Um, you need a lawyer to review these contracts. Um, you can pay these ten percent again to the seller or sellers directly, or to an agency. Uh, depends how you feel most comfortable. If you don't feel comfortable, you can also pay it in front of a notary. So then it's official. It has, there's a little cost involved. It costs a few hundred euros, 200 or 250 maybe. Uh, but then the money is deposited at a notary. Mm -hmm. And then seller and buyer can't access it. It gives you, gives you more more guarantees, maybe more, more, more peace of mind. Um, Again, with sellers, it, it, it depends here as well. If, if the, the, the case from the lady in the residency, imagine she passes away and you've paid 40,000 euros to her. Then even if, they, if, they, if the kids and the, or the heirs want to, want to run the process properly, it's still going to be complicated because you won't be able to access that money, et cetera, et cetera. So anticipate these things. Um, the lawyer is important. It's not necessarily sufficient because it's, it's, I always say it's very easy to buy a bad property with a good contract or with a perfect contract. Uh, the lawyer doesn't look at the long-term value for money. The lawyer doesn't look at how the street is at night. The lawyer doesn't care about who your neighbors are. Uh, lawyer cares about the contract itself. That's why we have lawyers in our team. Um, but you have to complement it with anticipating all these things that can go wrong in practice between buyers and sellers and with properties. Um, technical things that can that can be surprises with architects um, or with the bank. What, what happens if the bank says, no, we don't give you a mortgage. So that's things that happen in reality more and more today because of the, 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 the economic situation. Um, so these things need to be foreseen in the contracts. Mm -hmm. Often uh, regarding making a purchase conditional upon you getting a mortgage from a bank, many sellers don't accept it. They say, they say no, not accepted. Um, now, th there is often a way in the middle. Uh, it's not it's not like I want full flexibility if I can't get a mortgage, I can, I can, I can get out of the contract any time. You can find a way and say, I will do everything I can to get mortgage simulations from different banks in the next three, four weeks. If I, if I get a no from all these three banks in the next four weeks, I can get out of the contract. That's a lot more reasonable than saying, I want to be fully flexible and I want to be able to say in two months, I don't buy the property because my bank doesn't give me a mortgage. So these things, if, if, you, if they're clarified, it gives you a lot more protection rather than just accepting a no from, from, from a seller, potentially. When you've got your hours contract, I think then you can open a, a bottle of champagne. The property is secured for you. It's just waiting to get the finances arranged. You prepare for the notary. Um, and in, in this preparation phase, step nine, there's a lot of work to be done 
on the documents, the admin side, but also on, uh, in many cases, if a property is worth 300,000, the day of the notary, we don't allow our client to pay the full 300,000 to the seller. We often withhold part of the money, a few thousand euros typically, for things that still need to be sorted out. What with the city tax of this year? The seller needs to pay it still, but it's not paid yet. What with contributions to the community if it's, a, it's an apartment? What with some repair works that need to happen on the roof of a house? So rather than paying everything and just assuming they will repair it or even putting in a contract they will repair it, it's a lot smarter to withhold, to reduce some money, some amount, and only pay that later when certain conditions are met by the selling party. Because the sellers, once they've given you the keys, once they've received their money, um, if they don't want to, they don't have to pick up the phone. Uh, they don't need to fix anything anymore. So that's important in this preparation phase. Um, you go to notary. Um, and if it's prepared well, this should be very smooth. And in an hour, an hour and a half, you're done. You sign the documents, you show the check, you get your, your ID card, uh, you show your ID card, and you get the keys in your hand. Uh, in a lot of cases, it's not smooth. And I've seen a, a, a lot of, and people get very nervous, and I understand this, where, where, where there's big discussions, where there is shouting happening between, between who? Guess between who? Not between the buyer and the seller, between the seller and the agency. Remember, they are, the seller is a customer of the agency. They often end up in a fight because agencies had not been transparent on certain things, on how they charge their commission, how, how, these, how the, the total amount will be paid, etc. at a notary, and people freak out there. And these things need to be avoided. You, you've got to get these things on email, prepare it properly, uh, that's ex exactly clear if there's three owners, co-owners, three brothers and sisters, who gets what amount exactly, what amount is withheld, you pay by bank check or by transfer, um, um, all these things. What about the city tax for this year? Uh, sometimes it happens that you, that the, the seller, the agency will typically ask that you bring a separate check, bank check, uh, to pay, a, so to pay the commission of the agency, the commission the agency gets from the seller. So they want to split to reduce it from the seller's check and get it on their check. And they often don't tell their customer, the seller, that that's the way they want to do it. That's often disputes at the notary. So clarify these things. It's not pleasant if there is discussion, if there is fights at the notary office. Um, so you should walk out of the office with title of ownership and the keys in your hands and you can really access your property. It's important as well. So making sure it's empty. What we always do uh, or recommend at least is before you go to the notary the same morning, go and check out the property because you have signed your hours contract probably uh, a month, two, maybe three months before going to a notary. That property might be different. There might be water leaks. There might, the, 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 things might have happened with the property, with the entrance hall, with, uh, with the neighbors. So just check out these things. Uh, the, the same day before you go to a notary. And then, of course, once you're the owner, it means you have the rights on the property, you also have obligations regarding the property. Um, property needs to be registered in the land registry. You need to inform the city administration that you are the new owner, because you will have to pay the city tax um, from that moment onwards. Uh, you've got to pay your purchase tax, 10% in Catalonia, sometimes less in other parts of Spain. Uh, it's 10% VAT on new developments on off, off plan properties as well. Um, so these things need to happen. Um, um, the, the notary can take care of it or, or people like we, we do this for our customers, but it depends, but it needs to happen. Um, you've got obligations regarding the community of the owners. If it's an apartment, you've got to inform them you're the new owner, you've got to give them their bank, your bank account and so on and so forth. Change your utility contracts, uh, small things, but if you are too late changing a contract and the owner switches off, cancels the contract, you've got a major problem because it's very expensive to get a new, what they call Alta, a new contract for electricity, it costs several hundred euros potentially. You might have to wait till the guys from Andesa can come. It, it takes maybe a month, sometimes longer, um, and can, can be avoided again, um, already in the contracts in, in the previous step. So I've talked a lot now, 10, ten steps, um, 10 things to keep into mind. Um, you can open it up for questions now, but be, before that, 
I think there's um, if, you, if people might have to leave, it's nine. If you want to stay informed and, and, and know more about the property market, there's the next episode's coming, register. We will share the link uh, in the chat function as well now, so you can register directly. Um, on, the, on our blog, on Facebook, there is there's plenty of articles, interviews about the market, what about prices, what to be mindful of, etc. cetera. Um, if you are thinking of buying, selling, and you think I might benefit from some advice from people who do it every day, contact me, write me an email, or we'll send you we'll send as well in the, in the chat, I think, a, a link from Calendly, which you can use uh, to book a directly a, a Zoom meeting with myself. I, I do the first the first meeting is, is without commitment, it's, it's for free, it's, it's 20 minutes. Um, so you can do that as well. And there is, of course, the expat week coming up in, in two weeks from now, where there's different topics, not only about property. Uh, I, I went the property part, but there's other, other sessions. You might be interested in that as well. So, um, can we look at the questions? Do we have questions? Okay, so, yeah, the links have been shared here. Uh, the links for calendars for the meeting. Which age, Sophie, which agencies are dangerous to deal with? Techno Casa, three dots, question mark. Um, a very good question, Sophie. I guess because the fact that you mentioned this specific agency, you might have an experience with them. I don't know. Um, they, they, remember, the market has a reputation. Uh, agency, the market is not regulated. Agencies don't have a very good reputation because of all the things that happen and the horror stories that happen. And if you Google horror story property Spain, you find plenty of them, way too many. Um, so the one you mentioned is is an agency that is uh, uh, I need to see how I say this. Um, I don't like the way they work. Um, they do everything to try and get a deal done, and the the people who sell the property are not necessarily informed of what they are what they are selling. But the same happens with other agencies. Huh? Um, but they, they are very aggressive. That's that's their business model. Very aggressive. But, and there's a big but, there's an advantage of Techno Casa as well. Um, they often have very good properties at very sharp prices. Their business model is based on, on rotation. So having a property coming in to the agency and selling it as soon as they can. Therefore, they put prices lower than what other agencies would do. Um, but you have, I think the due diligence part with them is way, is probably way more important than with some other agencies. But there is, Agencies very similar to them, where the same is absolutely valid. Huh? You've got to be you've got to be careful. Um, it's an agency with high rotation in in their staff. Um, they, it's, it's it's a franchise model. Uh, it, it's it's another example. It, it's not true that, for example, you have a few in Spain, a few big agencies, the franchises. Um, it's not necessarily true that they are better than small agencies and local agencies or than the, or than the agency you mentioned. Uh, we've seen unacceptable things happening with agencies that position themselves as famous German brand, luxury agency, trusted partner. They're incentivized the same way uh, as, as any other agency. Yeah. Um, Another question, the due diligence is step seven, which is after the reserve. Does it mean it's if something pops up? I would lose my reserve money. Yeah, a good question. Also, you just contact that the agency asked me to sign has clause that I can't sign. Okay, so the first part of the question is, um, it, Sorry, my screen, my screen went, there's more questions coming in. Um, so you sign a reserve, if something pops up afterwards that you that, that, that you can't agree to, et cetera, do you lose your reserve? Um, it depends. Um, we, we never take a standard reservation contract. Um, so, so never from the internet, never from, from, from what the seller tells you. We make these contracts um, con conditional. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. We make these contracts conditional upon things that we can foresee. 
things that can impact the value of your property. And you can't list all these things as, as, as a condition, but we, you can make it sufficiently specific while staying general that it's it's clear that if the prices pop up, you have an exit of your reserva, you get your reserva back. So that should work. Uh, if there are thing if there are things in the AWAS contract that the agency wants to be in the contract and you can't agree to that, um, that's what you need to negotiate. You, you need to negotiate on the on the contract. We have contracts where in one day it's a done deal, everyone agrees. We have cases where it's two and a half weeks, three weeks sometimes to get a simple six page contract agreed between all the parties involved. Um, it, it's 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 hard to say. You got to you got to defend your interest. I recommend you don't sign things that you don't feel comfortable with, uh, because if everything goes as expected, you don't need a contract. The contract is necessary if things don't go as expected. So if you're not comfortable, push back. Start with the assumption. Keep in mind that the agency, the seller, they also want to sell. They know you've paid a reservation, um, and there might be a way to to convince them. Um, you've got, got, to, got to find the right style to negotiate, to discuss it, um, or, to, or to threaten them. You might step out of the deal if necessary. Um, so nor, normally you shouldn't lose a reserva, but it might be if, if it's major things that, that you can't agree upon and were not foreseen before. If the reserva wasn't good, then you might, might lose that. Um, what kind of certifications the house should pass normally? Oh, Sasha. Um, th th there's not too many. There is, uh, you, you, need, you need certain documents. Yes, you need um, energy certificate. You need a um, habitability certificate. They are fairly, it's administration. Uh, th these documents are requested at a notary. You can't sell without it or shouldn't sell without it. Um, uh, I think that, most important two are probably energy is not important. Cedula de habitabilidad, so the habitability certificate. Uh, if they, if the department, the house doesn't have it, it can be two reasons. Either it's not classified as a residential property, therefore you can't, you shouldn't live in it, you can't rent it out, you can't actually officially live in there, uh, or maybe the owner just lost the documents because they, they own the property since uh, several decades and maybe they can just request a new one by an architect in such a case we sent in an architect or we ask the owner to, to take an architect but normally it's quicker if, if we ask one of our architects to to go there to certify again to create that cedula that certificate again um, and and then it's okay we had we had someone recently who who committed to buy a property without a cedula and then realized they actually couldn't get a cedula and uh, and then, then they came to us like what do we do now so i think in that case the risk is high they lose they lose um the the 10 percent they paid it's not foreseen you, you if, if you agree in a contract that you don't need a, a cedula you have agreed to it you signed it so it's difficult uh, most important certificate probably is is, is then the the technical building inspections is for for older buildings out of a certain construction year year, year of construction um, and that in it's, it's a document of 80 100 120 pages where an architect uh, certifies the entire building all floors common communal areas facades rooftop everything and, and identifies areas that need improvement it's classified in urgent improvements or uh, nice to have light improvements, but if there's urgent improvements, you need to execute them. You need to, as a community of owners, you need to uh, contract a builder, get get a budget, get a quote, and do it. And the inspection comes back for your property. Um, sometimes properties are better priced because they didn't pass the inspection because people can't afford the money they need for the for the maintenance works, and therefore owners sell a property. Um, so keep keep that in mind. I think I, I don't see other questions here. Is there, there's people on the call, if you have questions, if you want to... No, no, technical building inspection is not only in Barcelona. No, no, that's, that's um, I don't know, you should get it in, if you buy in Valencia or so, it's also valid. Uh, it's, 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 it's not necessarily everywhere, but it uh, depends on the area we can see if it's necessary or not. And as of what age of the building it is, it is mandatory. Okay. 
Um, I hear someone speak in the background. I'm not sure who it is, but uh, it is a question. So let's launch maybe a quick poll, even a final poll before before we leave. Um, our, our goal was to give you information, to, to, to give you insights you need when, when you embark on a, on a journey. Uh, I would love to hear from you if this was helpful, if you like this, this webinar. Um, it's a bit different than the previous one. This was a bit more more structural in terms of step one, two, three, four, five. Um, the previous one was a lot more about the market the impact on the prices, um, which is, is probably a nicer story to listen to. Um, this is about things that can go wrong, but uh, which are important to know. So you, you see a message a pop up on your screen now, and would love if you could all vote and just let us know what you, what you, how you feel about the if you find it inspiring on a score from one to ten. Okay. So, uh, are coming in. Yeah, Victor. One of the questions that has come up in the past is why are, are, are the prices that are reflected online different from what they are ultimately transacted or how, how big of a difference are they? Yeah, um, good, good question. Um, there's no single answer to it. And uh, I would also refer to the article I, I wrote about a month ago or so in September. Maybe you can share it in the, in the group as well. Um, there is a gap between asking prices and deal prices, prices that buyer and seller agree upon. Um, the, the reason behind it, the, the, there's a lot of reasons behind it, but generally agencies try to convince sellers to go for a higher price so, so they get a sales mandate. They promise, they overpromise on the selling price. If, if it's worth 300, they will say, the way agencies value properties, they ask the owner for how much you want to sell it. Uh, great strategy to, to, <laughs> for an appraisal. And the owner says 320 and they say, oh, I can sell for 340 because they know another agency is coming. They might say 330 or 350. So there's, a, there's an auction between agencies. That's one of the reasons why the prices are inflated, are, are higher than, what it, well, than, than real prices and deal prices. Two ways that a lot of owners uh, are still wait, they, they, they are waiting and they want to see what happens with the markets. Um, there's no single indicator, economically speaking, that prices will go up this year or next year in Spain. Um, there's a lot of indicators that prices will drop significantly in this, the, this deals now. So as a seller, it's better to accept the discount now, take your money and run uh, if, if, you, if you want certainty. Um, but a lot, a lot don't do that because they're waiting and because they believe their property is better than other properties. So difference between asking price and, and, and deal price. Um, we see cases where it was a property in, in Poblisek, asking price 240. In the negotiation, they went down to 220 and it was bought for 179. That's an extreme example. It's not common, but the, the, the discount you can get, historically, discount depends on how the economy is going, the area, where is it located? Is it an attic? Is it the first floor, et cetera? That is still true, but there's another factor, and that, that, that became the main factor. The main factor today to the, that determines your discount is the urgency the seller has to sell the property, his or her urgency for cash. And there's a lot more people today uh, who, who want to sell, who need cash, and, if you've, and, and you see properties at very good locations at, at very strong discounts. Um, 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, it's, it's absolutely normal these days, but also zero, zero discount is also normal because some properties are priced extremely, uh, extremely attractive, attractive price. We, we recommend it for Tess, an, an English couple, Tess and Scott. Um, so probably of 240, we, we use big data tools to, to, to run appraisals on, on, on properties. We thought it's, it's somewhere in the range up to 280, maybe 290 in value uh, for lots of different factors. 240, we thought like it's a fantastic price to go for. We tried to negotiate, it was nothing, nothing possible on the negotiation side. The bank ran the, evalu the valuation, the appraisal on it. The bank rated it at 284 and purchased 240. So in such cases, uh, th that's why data is less important is less valuable today than it was maybe a year ago. Today, we've, you've got to be, you have to have this feeling with the market to understand if something is good or not good, if people are willing to pay for it, yes or no, and understand the, the urgency of the, of the seller. 
which is, by the way, something you need to develop a relationship with your seller from day one. The first time you visit the property, you, you have to start asking questions, bearing in mind at some point you have to negotiate. Mm -hmm. So why are they selling? How many owners are there? Um, how much did they put into the renovation? D different questions to, to build up your negotiation story afterwards. There's a question here when you say discounted by 40, 50,000, are you taking into account the 10% tax on this? Uh, no, I was just talking uh, property purchase price. So a property that was at, uh, uh, let's say 350 drops to 310. That, that's what I mean. The purchase tax is, an, is 10% on it. Uh, so that, that it will, will be lower because the purchase price is lower, but I was referring to the, to the, to the purchase price. In, I think most people are from Barcelona or thinking about Barcelona. Um, properties that were, let's say, 5% overpriced in January are probably 10 to 15% overpriced today on the market. But again, there's no general rule, and, and otherwise I would give you a percentage from, from our statistics, but um, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's, it's not the case. So you're all you mentioned you're all thinking of buying or investing. Um, if you have further questions, we will we have sent you in the chat here, send up a follow-up email. Um, I understand you might not want to share your questions in, in public here. Um, call, email me, set up this this one-to-one this -one meeting. I'll listen to your plans. I, my, my commitment is I'll listen to your plans. I'll tell you my honest opinion about it if I think it's feasible, it's realistic. And if you want to, I'm happy to give you a quote for our services for how we can accompany you. There was one question that came in uh, before the meeting, and the question was, at what time do you engage a lawyer? Um, I think that's a, that's a useful question. So first of all, I don't recommend to buy property without a lawyer. Um, secondly, when you, you need to do some legal reviews before you, before you sign a reservation contract, et cetera. You can't do all the legal reviews at that point because you won't get the documents. If, you, if there's no accepted offer, if, if there's no verbal or written deal, the seller won't give you all the information about the property. So that's why you need to make the reservation conditional upon. Um, but before the reservation, um, it's recommendable, strongly recommendable that you perform certain checks on documentation, information, owners, the property, et cetera. Um, to identify any red flags, but also to look at your reservation contract, that that is okay, that there is no, um, that, 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 that does protect you. All right. So it's very silent on your side. People are preparing dinner, I guess now. So uh, last thing, Rap, um, I also get asked about money in B. You've addressed it a little bit in terms of cash and so forth, but it used to be more common, or at least people would talk about paying money uh, in a private transaction. Uh, mm. How do you deal with this? I think mainly people who bought in Spain many years ago might have that experience or or might have seen these cases or might have done it or might have been offered it if you want to sell. Uh, today, you don't, you, you barely see it in the market because the, the tax administration has become very sophisticated. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't recommend you, so if, if people try and do it in their mind, what I say is if I, if a property is 300 and if I say to notary, let's buy it for 290 and I pay 10,000 in an envelope, I save 10% on that 10,000 to purchase tax. Okay, you save a thousand euros. The problems it can generate, uh, are are a lot bigger than the 1,000 euros, I think. So the benefit is small, don't do it. It's not what you should. Um, or if they offer it to you, don't do it. Um, if an agency asks to pay, there's something else. You, you might also pay in cash, and even if they say it's official then, because you, you can make cash payments uh, and, and have it absolutely official on invoice. Um, but be careful, because it, it's not the same as a, as a transaction um, it's harder to prove that you that you've paid, etc. So, um, uh, I, I don't like the the concept. Got it. Good to hear. Okay. 
So I think then, uh, thanks for your feedback. Um, the people who voted for, on, 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 I'll just, I think I want to share this. Um, old scores, all ratings were eight, nine or 10 out of 10 with the majority a nine out of 10, I think. And, and 80 plus percent, nine and, and 10 together. So that's, um, that's encouraging. Thank you for that feedback. And um, feel free to follow us and to reach out if you have further questions and you can make your purchase a success. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a very good evening. And thanks again. Bye.